No. That's fine. Thank you very much. We can move on to item two, which is declarations of interest. Does anybody have any new declarations of interest they need to raise? I have one myself, um, which is relating to item 10 on our agenda, which is the uh, NTU um, project application. I'm on the board of NTU, so I have a, an interest in the outcome of that. Uh, if there's nobody else, we can move on. So minutes, item three, the minutes of the previous meeting. If you just turn the pages with me, the, the number at the bottom, um, page one. Letting me have any comments. If you have any, two, three, four, five. So just one comment on page uh, four from myself. Um, so we received notification from Derbyshire County Council uh, that they've received the heads of terms back from uh, the other party that are involved in the Chesterfield Station Master Plan. So that one's been resolved from that point of view. Excellent. Thank you, Tom. Nothing else on four, five, six and seven. I will take silence as agreement that uh, you're happy with those as an accurate record of the meeting. Thank you very much. Stop those minutes then. Anything specific arising, Sir Judith, Tom, that we ought to take note of that doesn't come up on the agenda? So there are two things I just wanted to add. One, and I'm sure many colleagues will be aware of this. Um, yes, last week, and we were colleagues who were at the start of the meeting will have heard, that we had a letter from the Secretary of State, I think it was quarter to nine last Thursday or Wednesday evening, requesting a turnaround time for within a week to send back in scored and prioritised investment projects for the next 18 months um, to support in you know, a COVID recovery and economic activity within the region. So it might be helpful to touch upon that. We have a, a, a planned approach and we've been working with colleagues across the patch to, to respond. Um, David, Pat, you let me know when you want me to do that, but maybe I do that as part of the pipeline or we can do it sooner. I think let's do it as part of the pipeline. It's a natural place for it. OK, and the only other one to mention, and maybe Sarah may want to cover it, is we did have our scrutiny review last week. Um, so perhaps just um, very constructive, very helpful. Might be just helpful, firstly, to, to note that it's happened. And I'm, I'm sure members will be keen to hear that we are continuing the work around ensuring scrutiny around all areas of our work. But with this, this was particularly on the focus around performance. It might be helpful to just feedback from that, Sarah. Yeah, so uh, we had uh, a meeting of the working group, um, which is part of the Derbyshire County Council uh, scrutiny uh, set up. Um, so um, we there are, there are some papers um, which have been published uh, online and the minutes will go online as well. And um, so, yeah, we discussed performance. We discussed sort of the implications of COVID, where we are, um, the outcome of the annual performance review. We updated the members on that. Um, and we're now looking towards meeting um, later on in the year and I've been having discussions with the scrutiny officer around subjects and probably going to start looking at, uh, at the strategy area. So obviously the three main areas that we get assessed by government, governance, strategy and delivery, we've sort of done delivery and we thought we'd move on to the next area of strategy. So that's, um, we've already got a date penciled in I think so. so. So we're sort of getting in the flow now of, of having those regular meetings. Thanks, Sarah. I didn't say before, but please feel free to put your hand up or put something in chat if you want to uh, if you want to raise something. Comfortable to move on to item four? OK, so, so if I start and then um, yeah. I'll ask Tom to uh, take us through the project change request. We we all know that we are in the final year of the programme. So as we come into the last year of the programme, we have got an, a remaining allocation of 40 million against the total 250 million to be delivered within this financial year. And the challenge and the pressure still is to deliver by the 31st of March 21. There isn't any, um, at this point in time, flexibility or extension to that deadline, and that's what we're working to. We're still confident, based on our ongoing conversations with projects, that we can achieve that. And as we go through today's meeting, we've got a number of projects that are before you for approval and additional projects that have been brought forward to ensure that we fully commit our programme and mitigate any risk of any underspend. 
if we achieve all of that, and clearly we are in June and we can only give you a snapshot in time, at this moment in time, our assessment is we are on track to deliver our program, um, notwithstanding that there may be some challenges along the way, which we will come to. Clearly, we've highlighted at uh, the last meeting um, the ongoing review we're taking with projects around impact to COVID. At this moment in time, we're um, and the projects are listed within the paper in terms of the individual projects and where they're at. As we as we uh, sit here today, projects are progressing, construction sites are back up and running in many cases. Cases. I think those that have had internal fit out have had most delays, particularly around in, uh, implementing social distancing measures, which has resulted in increased time and cost. Um, in terms of cost, at this moment in time, we continue to track to see uh, what that means in terms of additional cost and therefore risk to the delivery of that project and the outputs that we're buying as a consequence, and we'll continue to monitor and measure. There is an inherent challenge in that there is no additional money for new for any cost overruns and contractually our commitment has always been with any project or sponsor to underwrite any cost overruns. We can we will continue to monitor and understand what those risks are. Uh, conversation with government at the moment isn't in the space where we are looking at additional money for projects. We're in that review stage to understand the risks and feedback uh, and manage thereafter. In terms of um, a request from government, as we are in the final year of the programme, we have been asked to submit by tomorrow our assessment of our ability to deliver and commit contractually our remaining funding. We're confident based on the figures that we put before you that we will commit and deliver our programme. The change that government have made this year, and this is across the board, bearing in mind there's 1.2 billion pounds of funding left in this year across the 38 LEPs, and clearly from a government perspective, they want to ensure that they manage any risk of under delivery. And therefore, whereas in the past, all LEPs will have had their funding paid up front um, in April or May, this year, government have only up front paid two thirds of their funding, with a third being withheld, subject to the outcome of the review of projects and, and the programme that we're putting before government. So you will see within our uh, programme that we're currently committed 94.7% of our programme. And if all of the projects that have been put before you today are approved, we believe we'll get to 95.5%. And in terms of the remainder of the balance, we are still on track to fully commit and spend our, our funding within this financial year. And that, you know, they are, this is subject to the decisions that we'll be asking you to make through the rest of this meeting. So if, for example, um, I'll, I'll just cover in brief here, but come, come on later. Uh, after the last meeting in discussion with Nottingham City Council, the council withdrew Crocus Place as a potential project, um, which meant that three million pounds from the programme um, was returned back into the pot. We've got a proposal under pipeline projects for you to consider additional projects to bring back into the LGF programme, which mitigates um, the spend being lost or uh, are in and making sure that we are on track to deliver. So at this moment in time, my overall assessment is we're on track to deliver the programme. Um, we we it will require clearly ongoing work between now and March. We have got some mitigation in place. The, the key issue will be if there's significant delays and cost overruns that we will need to be mindful of um, and, and bear in mind that that may have an impact on projects ability to complete. So Chair, um, I'll stop at that point before I ask Tom to cover the, the change request, unless Tom, there was anything I missed from that overview. No, nothing to know. Catherine. Thanks, David. It was it was just a, a follow up comment, really, Sajida, in terms of um, the impact on projects of COVID and the risk of cost overrun. Um, I'm sure other areas have have this experience, but where the silk mill is concerned, um, things have moved on positively since this paper was issued because works have started again on site. Um, however, we do know there's going to be a cost issue um, increase with that project and we were hoping that we could take a shared funder approach to that so some kind of pro rata sharing of, of that cost overrun we obviously we understand the LEPS position on this as you've outlined but I think it's just worth um, sharing for the record that that um, I guess other projects will be experiencing this we are we are talking very proactively with with the other funders of this project um, and it's just worth noting that if if there are any further opportunities in in the future from government to <laughs> to help ease those those cost increases, then we'd be would be really keen to work with you on that. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, David. Are you happy for me to respond? 
course, yes. Oh. Yeah. So fully appreciate uh, the position Silkman are in. And as you know, I had a conversation with Greg in terms of understanding yeah. that. You know, so on one level, absolutely sympathetic and recognise that the, the situation we're in has caused undoubted risks to projects' ability to deliver and the cost overruns. The challenge that we have, and I'm sure you'll appreciate with a programme the size that we've got, it's not the only project. Mm -hmm. And if we were to consider one project from a transparency and, you know, frankly, being fair, we would have to take that same position on every project. The knock on impact that would then have is first, we wouldn't be able to afford it. And secondly, it wouldn't deliver us any additional outputs for the funding. And therefore, we've been in a position where we, in fact, we haven't got the funding. And the only way you'd be able to do it is not approve any of the projects from today to be able to uh, fund cost overruns. But that won't then be able to buy the outputs that we need to deliver for the funding. And government's position at this moment in time hasn't been, and David's on the line, and I will come to him. Sorry, David. Um, from, from a government perspective, there hasn't been yet any discussion around how we fund cost overruns. So it, it's, that, it's that fine balance between being sympathetic, but recognising the precedent issue of funding any one project and then having to fund the entirety of the programme. But the impact that would have is we wouldn't be able to afford that and it would, wouldn't buy us any additional outputs for the same in return. So, you know, welcome views from the investment board um, and particularly perhaps David Williams, we go to David Wright for a view from government in terms of how that might be handled elsewhere. David Wright, do you have a view? Uh, hi, yes, thank you. Um, so in terms of, so just right, we've not kind of the LGF review and the uh, process at the moment in time is not kind of dealing with cost overruns. Um, but through the LGF review, we do want to be made aware of these things. So if private sector investment has fallen away as a result of COVID or there are issues with projects, then yes, we do want to be made aware. The purpose of the LGF review at this point is to ensure delivery within this year. Um, and that's uh, to understand can it, what, what exactly can be delivered and also uh, an idea of contractual commitments this year. But it's very much in terms of ensuring that projects have the money that can spend uh, within the financial year. If the, I, I think it's just the point of, of raising those issues that if there are cost overruns, if there have been kind of private sector investment has fallen away, that we're made aware of those things so we can feed those in. So it's a logical thing for colleagues to log them with the LEP, with Tom presumably, and we can send them together to MHCLG or whoever. Yes, so where, where we are aware where they've come forward, uh, we have incorporated them as part of that in-year LGF review um, and the documentation is ready. So for instance, with the Silk Mill Catherine, uh, it has been logged there as an issue. Um, so they're in. Yeah, in that review. Thank you. And in the interest of transparency, there are other projects like Nottingham College, Ashbourne Airfield, Woodville. You know, there are, we could probably go through the whole program and identify that they are projects that, because of COVID, will have had cost overruns. Um, so where we are aware, and and we are in close contact with all projects, we will make that point as we already a reference in the LGF review. And if government does have, you know, a view on how they might support that in the future, clearly we will obviously come back to all projects. But you will appreciate from our perspective, I think it has to be done in a fair and transparent way. So every project is considered. OK, perfect. So Judith, Tom, do you need approval for the project change request? Yeah, so I'll just um, do a brief bit on that. So Riverside Business Park uh, was a project that was approved by us in May 2019 um, to bring forward around £3.4 million pounds worth of uh, local growth funding. Um, it was to fund just for those that weren't around at that point in time um, or may not have seen the scheme or be familiar with it. Um, new employment space in a hotel uh, just north of Bakewell heading out on the A6. Um, so we are working with a private sector developer, um, Lytton Property Group, who are the project sponsor for this. Um, what's happened with this is there's been delays to the hotel being signed up to um, due to uh, the implications of COVID in the current situation, um, which has restricted how much funding is being utilised on that site and how much construction work is taking place in total. Uh, as part of that project approval and every private sector approval that we have, we usually work on a 50-50 uh, drawdown basis with private sector projects. So 
where we would usually just um, give 100% of the cost that have spent on a public sector project to the project once they've spent that money um, with the private sector we make sure that they are putting in 50% of the match funding at each point in time at each quarter um, so then we're showing a, a fair and even spread from that point of view. Basically, the implication of COVID has meant that um, the private sector developer won't be able to utilise that full amount of spend um, on that 50-50 equity basis. Um, so what we're requesting is a change in the terms of this funding agreement um, to bring forward that we 100% spend the uh, LGF money on this project up front um, from when they're drawing down till the end of March. And then we will continue to monitor this project uh, on an ongoing basis to make sure that they are putting in the match funding uh, allocation that they said they were going to. In terms of our funding, um, it's really the only way that we'll fully utilise this capital uh, funding on this project. So it's our only pragmatic solution to making sure that we can deliver this project fully. Um, and it actually has potential in some ways to um, help to deliver this scheme quicker than we first thought. So by this change, it has worked out uh, somewhat in our favour, um, but we didn't want to just approve the 100% um, grant drawdown uh, without the say so of the board. So we're just looking for an approval to bring forward 100% drawdown at this point in time, rather than the usual 50-50. I have a query myself, but Trish, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I just want to uh, to say that I think this is a win-win situation and uh, and shows that um, where the LEP can, it is using a flexible approach to uh, to coping with COVID-19. And um, obviously, I understand why the government are feeling like they are doing. Let's hope they, they also give us some, uh, some flexibility down the line as well. So uh, thanks to the team for uh, recommending this. I, I support it. Sam? Yes, thanks. Is that proposal a decision for today or are you saying you're going to bring a proposal forward for another for another time? Is that are you proposing that now, Tom? Yeah, that's been proposed now, yeah. What safeguards are there for public money? So <clears throat> I understand what, what, what you're proposing and the benefits yeah. of that, but how can you assure us about safeguards around uh, public expenditure on the project? Yeah, so uh, in terms of that, we when we signed up to this uh, grant contract with Riverside Business Park, there was actually a clause put into the contract that our funding cannot go over 20% um, of profit on cost on this project. Otherwise, it's not deemed as state aid compliant in the long run. Um, so we'll continue to monitor this in the years going forward and follow through with their expenditure to make sure that they are putting up the amount of match funding that they said they would at this point in time. Um, if not, then we have clawback in place and we can actually and would have to in this instance go after the project to claw that money back because if not we'd be deemed as um, breaching state aid regulations. So we'd need to go after it rather than... Yeah. And I'd add that um, Pete Hanford um, Section 151 officer has also looked over this request. Understandably, Sam, your concerns were the ones that we also highlighted and recognising that we, you know, pred predominantly our funding contracts are with the public sector. This is an exception. So protecting the public purse is clearly part of our role. And the measures that we've got within the contract enable that to be put into place. This doesn't expose the public sector to any more risk. Um, if anything, it accelerates the public in intervention to bring forward the development and therefore the jobs that will flow, which is the reason for our investment. So based on what's been put forward and based on the legal advice and the co contract we have in place, our public investment is protected by the arrangements that are in place with Lytton, the Lytton Group. OK, thank you. Thanks, Sarge. That was the same question. Mine was the same as Sam. So uh, thank you for raising that, Sam. Any more for any more? OK, all done on item four then. We can go on to the excitement of item five, pipeline projects. Joe, sorry. Ignore it, please. Thank you. OK. Pipeline projects, Saj. OK, thank start? you very much. So I'll, I'll start on this and then perhaps if I do this pipeline and then we'll talk about the Robert Jenrick request at the end. 
So uh, I mentioned at the outset uh, with the withdrawal of Crocus Place um, by Nottingham City Council for you know, very clear and understandable reasons, it did mean that the programme had a um, un unallocated amount of £877,000 in the last year. And you'll recall that our position right from the outset has always been to ensure a level of over programming to mitigate against such risks or other projects not delivering within the time frame. And when we undertook the last pipeline call um, and you know, we did always commit to ensuring that we would have a flow of projects should we be in a position like we are and we we'll continue to work with those projects, which we have done. And as a result, what we've now identified through the pipeline assessment that was um, launched in, in March, two further projects that are deliverable um, compared to when they were submitted in March. So just to be clear, what we undertook in terms of a transparent approach was looked at all the projects that came forward in March, reviewed them all to see where projects had developed further than they were by March and where circumstances had changed to enable a score that was higher than they were back in March. So as a result of that, there were only two projects where that score would change significantly, and that was due to issues around unconfirmed commitments around funding, around planning, or questions around their ability to deliver. There are clearly other projects in the pipeline, but at this point in time, their circumstances or the value for money in terms of outputs didn't change significantly in order for, their, for us to recommend them to you as projects that could be taken forward. So that's the process that we went through in terms of identifying these two. On the back of that, the two projects are put before you. We're recommending that we endorse as expressions of interest and ask to submit formal business cases. That would then mean that we would over program, the, um, we'd commit the 877,000 that's unallocated, but also over program by a further £2 million utilising the Growing Places Fund, which has always been the buffer that we've used to fund any over program. So the two projects that are put before you are essentially uh, an automotion and robotics training facility at West Knotts College in Mansfield and a YMCA community and activity learning village in Newark. So the two projects between them, having been rescored, they are now they were previously where they were under the, the threshold of 61. They've now been rescored based on the changed circumstances and particularly on the automotion with further information around business engagement, around its delivery model, around its ability to deliver the, the outputs. And then the second on the YMCA project, there were still concerns at that time around funding commitments and outstanding planning. Those have now been satisfied and having been rescored by our external consultants, they now both score at 65 and therefore we would recommend them to be put forward. So David, before I go through the two projects, can I just stop in terms of the process just to make sure that everyone's comfortable with the way in which we've arrived at these two projects. OK, I don't think there's any any um, come back on that or any questions. So if there isn't, I'll carry on. Um, please do mention anything in the in the chat bar if you did want me to stop at any point. So the first project is put forward by West Knotts College um, and it's for £673,000 against an £898,000 project. And essentially the, uh, this project will allow the college to forward fund equipment or purchase, um, purchase equipment to enable them to deliver uh, support to their business base to adapt to uh, enabling more robotics and automation within the business base, particularly around manufacturing. Now, you will recall on a number of uh, bases when we undertook the assessment around the local industrial strategy and we looked at the risk of automation, Mansfield was identified as one of the areas at the highest risk of automation given its industry and its business base. This recognises that need, it provides forwarded support for businesses to adapt. There is demand from the business base, even post COVID, this has been tested with the SME manufacturing base, and there is appetite for businesses to take on board additional support through all the different levels of apprenticeships and different levels of learning um, to enable this support to be to, to be recognised as something that is uh, meeting a demand, but also supporting a transition. If anything, post COVID, I think the risk and, and recognising the mood towards digitalization and automation is increased and therefore we believe that this is a strong um, applicant and it's a strong project. Some of our past concerns were given that um, particularly um, investment board members that were on on the IIB will recall that West Knotts College did have some issues in the past in terms of their ability to deliver therefore we wanted to be satisfied that if we did fund the project those past issues were addressed and that they are now indeed and they have confirmed and we've 
validated that they are on track to deliver the outputs that they were passed um, uh, committed to. So this is additional investment, but for additional outputs. So for, on that basis, and given that in particular, uh, given the time frame, it is funding equipment and therefore clearly deliverable. The delivery will happen post um, uh, this academic year, given the, the conditions in terms of training and learning. So there will be a delay in terms of the outputs being delivered. But in terms of the ability to deliver the, the, the project, we're satisfied that because of the nature of the investment, um, it's deliverable within this financial year. So subject to board's approval, our recommendation would be that we would bring this forward uh, as a full business case for consideration. Perhaps, David, if I stop there for, for any questions and go on to the next one. Let's get approval from individually. So any questions on that project? And I'll take silence as approval. OK. I think so. Thank you. So perhaps if I then move on to the next one, and I've just noticed um, Joe's just declared, Joe Bradley's declared interest on this particular project. So thank you. We'll note that. So the next project is put forward by the YMCA. Now this is a completely different project to one that perhaps we've ever brought before you, and it is a it's quite a, a different style of project. But I think what it's intending to do is quite innovative, and it's why the YMCA's flagship project in the country, and it brings together unique proposal within Newark to create a, a community facility which has a number of phases. The first phase is already up and running. It provides a, an outdoor track and a, a climbing facility within Newark. But fundamentally, the phase that we're being asked to consider is to create a community to provide integrated learning for communities that are probably the hardest to reach in the sense that people that wouldn't traditionally access mainstream learning either in a college or university setting would be uh, would access that support with wraparound support for whole families providing you know child care wraparound um, intergenerational support recognizing that particularly newer which is probably the area in or the second in the whole country in terms of social mobility and significant challenges in terms of disadvantaged communities to address that fundamental need to support individuals to increase their ability to learn and therefore move into employment and, and uh, overcome barriers to financial um, uh, challenges. This was always a flagship project and Newark um, District Council have always been very supportive, as have others. Nottingham, uh, Newark College are on board, Nottingham Trent are on board. They've got over 50 different providers coming in um, to, to deliver short and long courses that are accredited to a community that wouldn't access support otherwise. It is different, but it is still accredited learning and recognising the needs of that community, which, if anything, as a result of COVID and particularly the, the early indicators show that young people um, are likely to be more disaffected and impacted by any unemployment and th the need for this type of intervention, particularly in a community like Newark, it, uh, we believe is actually e even stronger now than it was pre-COVID. So. We've tested the project and our view and our recommendation to you would be that we would invite a full business case. We would need to do a full due diligence on the financials. Our early assessment demonstrates that that 2.2 million pound investment against a total 10 million pound project would deliver a significant impact in that region. So our initial recommendation to you is to invite a full business case and it would be a subject to a full due diligence um, before a business case is brought back. So I'll take any any questions um, and Tom, if anybody wants to add anything, please do so. But I'll stop there in terms of um, a, a, my summary to you. Catherine. Thanks, David. I, I think um, it like you say, Sajida, it's a really exciting model, isn't it? It's a really different way of providing services to a really um, vulnerable group that needs more help than ever, I guess, given given the economic circumstances we're in. Um, I know you've said about due diligence and full business case, which is obviously a step we need to go through on this project. Um, I'm, I'm just curious as to, given the timescales involved, um, how far along the planning route project because it's quite a significant capital investment there with a very short timescale for delivery. So just at a very high level, where have they got in terms of um, the match funding and planning consent and, and you know, key key milestones for delivery? So yeah. we wouldn't well, put this in terms of sorry, achievability. We wouldn't have put this forward if those elements weren't in place and that was a prerequisite. Planning is in place and the funding is in yeah. place and they're ready yeah. to go. Okay. And because of the early site enabling work, we believe that two million pounds, given that the work that they're already undertaking is fully achievable. Tom? Yeah. yeah just, 
Okay, thanks. Just jumping in on that one. So yeah, match funding uh, contributions we have confirmed uh, with the YMCA that they're all in place. Planning was an issue as we stated before, but that's been granted for the piece that we need now. Um, and then uh, in terms of the actual piece to spend this money, we have been in touch with the YMCA about their sunk costs already. Uh, there's a significant amount on that um, that we could already claim as expenditure towards this project. So we've got no doubt. Um, I don't think if we start when we think with this project that we should be able to spend it. And even if we'd start a bit later, we would be able to. Just one thing to note on the paper, there is a typo saying completion happens in January 2021, as Joe pointed out to me earlier today. Uh, that would be the world's quickest build of a facility of this size. So it's actually looking more towards next summer, so July, August kind of date, some 11 month turnaround on that. So yeah, a, a typo on that one. Tricia? Yeah, um, uh, yeah, I think this is a, a really good project. Youth unemployment is an increasing concern. I was um, on a national call with um, with council leaders yesterday and it's uh, it's now the the emerging issue um, in Chesterfield. Our uh, youth unemployment rate will increase by ten percent, and that's seven hundred young people on the claimant register. Um, and in rural areas, that can be even more more difficult uh, because you know there's 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 not the opportunities to travel to another town in the same same way as there is in the conurbation and um, and based on my previous uh, work experience I do know that the voluntary sector are so much closer to communities than some of the the larger more formal providers so uh, um, I do have confidence that they will get at the people who need really need this help as well so uh, I'm very supportive of the project coming forward. Thanks, Trish. Anybody else? Do we have approval for this project then? And again, I'll take. Ah, sorry, Carol. Muted, sorry. Carol. Yeah, uh, more or less uh, agreeing there. I think, uh, especially coming out of COVID, I think this is a really good project that will will really benefit. So, uh, yeah, very supportive, and look forward to a business case coming forward. Thanks, Carol. Again, do we have approval? I'll take silence as acceptance. I think lots of nods and probably quite a lot of enthusiasm for that. So that's excellent. Thank you. Brilliant. So perhaps Sag, if I, if I just cover the, sorry. Yeah. I was going to say, shall I cover the Robert Jenrick letter and how we're proposing to respond to that? So we mentioned at the outset that we had a request from government um, to submit our prioritised list of investable propositions, shovel ready to support the economy in terms of turning around post COVID with a view of um, firstly submitting by this Thursday, but deliverables within the next 18 months. So in that context, given the short turnaround time, our approach has been to build on the pipeline projects that we've had already, and we're scoring those that were almost in that deliverable stage, um, but didn't quite make the cut for this financial year with a view to seeing if those can be brought forward. Secondly, we've asked all of our local authorities, universities and colleges, predominantly public sector bodies that uh, can uh, demonstrate projects are deliverable to put forward their proposals by today. We had a conversation yesterday with all of our upper tier authorities and district representatives to understand the potential pipeline of projects coming forward with a very and, and those two measures are absolutely going to be the, the mechanism by which we will have to sift. Can they be delivered and therefore do they have planning in place? Is much funding in place? Is there complex land assembly that would be a barrier to delivery? And, and, and any other risks in the same way we have done to projects for this financial year. And secondly, how do we demonstrate the return on investment and particularly the value for money for the types of jobs created and economic activity, which is the key that government are looking for? How can we boost economic interactions within uh, through those investments that would uh, provide a boost po um, in the recovery from COVID? So our approach will be once we receive all of those proposals through and in a transparent way, in the same way we've always done, we will score those all on those criteria. And our recommendation is to use the same scoring matrix we've already done and put forward a proposed list to government by Thursday. T rapid turnaround time, um, and we've, we've engaged with officers at senior levels across authorities and had input from the universities and FE institutions, and we will put forward 
the most the, the most robust case possible, but with a key eye on making sure that we're credible in terms of our ability to deliver. Um, so, D David, I, David Williams, did you want to add anything? And then perhaps David Wright, if you wanted to add anything. Not specifically to what you just said, but in, in terms of the generality of this. And to repeat a theme that's not particularly popular, but um, this is not the first time we've had such a call and it's not probably the last time we've had such a call. And the frustration that I might have is that we will always have a short deadline. So therefore, we ought to have a, a pipeline worked up and ready. And that's what I've been trying to push through our place board. And we have theoretically 10 priorities, but they're, they're not really as well worked up as they could be. If I was guessing, and I'm far less expert than any of you probably, there will be, a, there will be some kind of autumn budget, some spending review. And you can expect before we go into some new kind of austere lockdown, that we will be asked to spend money around autumn time. So we should be planning now. We don't know what that money will be. We don't know what it will be for. But most of these projects tend to morph from one thing into another. We should be getting a proper pipeline list together in anticipation of the next call whenever it comes. It could be sooner than autumn for all we know. But we ought to be planning rather than having to react as we constantly have to to these short term calls. That's all I would say, just a plea really. So let's get ourselves our act together to be ready for the next one. David Wright, you want to add anything in there? Uh, yes, thanks, David. Um, I think uh, just to kind of set the context for this, this is about uh, creating jobs, safeguarding jobs and stimulating demand in the economy. It is quick turnaround. It is quick delivery. Um, and it's very much a it's not the only thing that will ever come. I think, as David has said, you know, I, I would well expect this is addressing an issue that is now is very current. Uh, and as we move towards recovery and out and we transition out of the kind of response phase, uh, it's important that we recognize, you know, the issues and the forecast that, you know, the impacts of, on unemployment. Uh, it's been mentioned earlier on the call about the impacts on youth unemployment, et cetera. So, uh, yes, it is a t tight turnaround, but I think the work that, you know, uh, the LEP's done in terms of earlier in the year, in terms of getting their pipeline call together, having scored projects, having a process in place has really set them in a good position. So I think it just, it's building on that and, and kind of echoing your comments really, David, that um, I would imagine there will be further opportunities. So it's being able to respond to those as and when they come up. Thank you, David. Anybody else? No? Okay, no. So can we move on from the pipeline then to the uh, item six, the LGF budget paper, Sarah? Yeah, um, I think I think we probably said it all already, but I'm just, yeah. just confirmed. So obviously um, before the previous item, we had a undercommitment for the programme. Um, by adding those two projects on, that will now take us to the two million overcommitted. Um, obviously, the paper still shows the undercommitment because the projects haven't been put on. So by the next meeting, obviously, I'll add those two on. Um, I've also included as well in the appendix two um, the summary of the quarterly payments, which are for the final year. We're obviously in the final year now, um, and this is project by project. Um, and and we've been working on these figures more internally um, because obviously we've we've said about the two thirds money. So we've been working on on the cash flow, which is really important this year because we've obviously only had the two thirds of the money. So I can report we won't run out of cash. We do have enough money. Um, we just need to ensure that that we can secure this final third payment, and that's uh, by the quarter three. Um, so. This is obviously based on these projects that have got to come forward um, and they and they've obviously fed back information that they've got in their business cases. Um, so when we meet next time, I'll add the two on um, and that will show the two million pounds over commitment. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Any queries or can we take the paper as read? Again, silence, acceptance. Excellent. Thanks, Sarah. Item seven, Tom. Milestones. 
Yeah, so I'll just run through these now. So um, we are looking at uh, Beckett Well is the first one up. So as we know with this project, the allocations utilised um, already on pre-compliance uh, spending that we've had. Um, Derby City continue to work through their reserve matters um, with the decision expected in September. So we will just await that business case uh, later on in the year. But again, to re-emphasize on this project, although the approval date is technically late, uh, funding has been utilized for it. So it, it gives off some of that risk from there. Um, on the Woodville Swaffling Cape project, so there has been two sort of delays on this project. So there is firstly, uh, the Secretary of State um, sign off for the compulsory purchase order is still awaited. Um, we have been in contact with the FT uh, on numerous occasions and so has uh, David Wright uh, trying to chase that up on our behalf as well. Um, we're unsure as to when that will come through but uh, Jim Seymour from Derbyshire County Council informed me earlier uh, that some progress has been made with that so we're hoping that we'll get that back um, because that's not come to this meeting and there's still some minor procurement issues with regards to changes in potential pricing uh, around COVID that need to be formalised. Uh, I'm looking to take this project directly to the LEP board in July, um, which will take place on the 8th of July um, for a final business case sign off there. So we're not holding up this project. Um, it's quite tight in terms of the uh, spend um, for the project. We've got a fair amount of sunk costs on it, um, but there is still the fact that because of the, the scale and the amount of funding that we need to spend, it's got a drawdown, um, which is, leaves it close to the March deadline. So we don't want to hold it up in any way possible. And we're hopeful that that Secretary of State sign off can get things moving as soon as possible. So we're looking at a July uh, let board for that. Um, spoke with the A46 corridor last week about this project, um, still looking towards uh, similar timescales as before. So tenders out to contract, uh, contract sorry, in July, um, with the tenders in and the contractor appointed uh, in October of this year for a November approval date. Um, a large scale development in its total cost. So we're not too worried about the 0.75 million pound overall spend because a lot of that will be used through the design and planning processes. But then also if they start on site with three months to go, they should uh, utilize that allocation at that point in time. Um, it is an office based project and there are just some queries about sort of demand for that office space, but we're in regular contact with Rushcliffe Borough Council uh, about the project. So we've got that in hand um, and this was always going to be a late approval um, for a November uh, final business case. Next one is the Heathcote Immersive Incubator project with Nottingham City Council. Uh, everything's still running to date um, as of the revised dates of July 2020 for the tender returns to be received. Um, and we're hoping that actually they can start on site late August in terms of mobilisation works, um, but that it's looking more like September now. Um, rather than the August they were looking at. But again, spend profile on this project and the cash flow that we've received from them uh, indicates that we should be able to utilise this um, money fairly easily within the timescales of March 2021. Um, and the September approval will give us no worries in terms of that project coming forward. So fairly uh, confident on that one. Um, Smart Connected Campus project with NTU, so uh, the designs are looking to be complete still in July. Um, procurement still on track to be completed in August, had a conversation with the um, with the project team on that last week and they are still confident of meeting these uh, timelines for development. A lot of capital equipment purchases uh, towards the 800,000 um, allocation for this project. So again, confident that that spend will be met um, and there should be no issues with that project to deliver. So hoping that they'd be done around December, January time uh, in terms of the spend on that project. Uh, Tolbar House, this project still continuing to move forward and um, the final business case is near enough ready. They are just finalising off the um, June uh, finishing off the uh, contractor, sorry, uh, selection at this point in time. So they'll submit the final business case to us. It says an F 
BC approval to board in July. Um, there was supposed to be a meeting on the 15th, and I was going to bring this up later, uh, but it's probably more poignant to bring it up now. We are now looking at the start of August for um, a an investment board date uh, to try and fit that one in. So we'll be looking around the fifth or fourth uh, or fifth of um, August, I believe, the dates that we're looking at at the moment. So we'll schedule that in, um, but they should come forward. It delays the it doesn't delay the project at all. Um, and allows the contract mobilisation to to start uh, on time with what they thought it would. So we're fairly confident that of spend again on that project, and we should be able to deliver it. Error Washborough Council, when I spoke to them uh, a couple of weeks back, it gave us that reassurance that they still think uh, that they will be able to utilise that four hundred and thirty thousand uh, fairly easily within the time periods again. There's the revitalising the Heart of Chesterfield project. This is currently split out in two phases, but actually after discussions with um, Chesterfield Borough Council uh, last week, hence why it's still split out on these papers, um, we have decided to sort of make a change to the project and bring it forward on a phase basis with the two projects brought together. It will mean that it will be local assurance framework compliant um, at that point in time, but what it actually allows us to do is guarantee the spend so uh, even more. So the £650,000 will be utilised on the first phase of the development with Chesterfield Borough Council picking up the second phase, which is the outdoor market scheme um, and uh, funding that piece of the development as well as parts of the public realm scheme. So it gives us that confidence and reassurance that we'll be able to meet that spend deadline before March. Uh, while still being fully local assurance framework compliant and everything above board. So it's a more um, pragmatic way for us to deliver uh, this project. Then there's the Omics research facility that the University of Derby are looking to uh, purchase capital equipment for. Um, £850,000 worth of local grace fund looking to be spent through this project. Um, and they are on track with all of their milestones at this point in time. Again, capital equipment purchases mean that once those uh, tenders are back in and awarded, it's a fairly simple process in terms of receiving the goods and then sort of paying out the invoices on them. So we are confident still again of the March 21 uh, spend deadline um, and all milestones track into it. And then there is the mushroom farm project. So uh, this is the last project that we have currently on the milestones paper. They did actually hit the milestones in terms of going out for ten, uh, to tender on this project, um, but actually received uh, the tender prices that they didn't think that they would uh, get. They were slightly higher. Um, not sure entirely as to why, but Brock's are fairly confident that they will go back out to a tender process again um, and look to bring this project back um, to us in September. Now, it's a delay of around three months in terms of that business case being delivered to us. But again, due to the size of the intervention um, and how quickly this project will be able to spend due to the actual build process, it doesn't actually pose that much risk to us um, as a LEP in terms of our March 21 spend deadline. Um, I will be and I continue to sort of engage with Brock's though on a weekly basis about this one, really. So they are still um, fully aware of the need to utilise this money by then, um, but they just need to go out to a new tender process to make sure that their costs come back into line with what their original budget were. And they were actually fairly confident that that would be the case. I think it was just maybe a blip around the timing of when they received uh, tenders back due to the COVID. Uh, situation that was going on then so fairly confident with that and then just to add we'll add the two new projects onto the next investment board um, and get a set of milestones with them but they won't be on the milestones register for very long hopefully because they should both come for an approval fairly quickly after that. Any thanks Tom. Catherine have you got your hand up? I have yes thanks thanks David I didn't want to interrupt your flow Tom but just where Beckett Wells concerned, yeah. um, in the interests of complete transparency, the, the report suggests that we'll secure um, reserve matters consent in September. Um, mm -hmm. And there's likely to be a slight delay on that. I think our project team have discussed it with you um, and it just didn't quite make it into the into the papers in time. Um, mm -hmm. But just to give the board reassurance on that, the two outstanding things on Beckett Well are 
full planning consent and investment funding. And given the COVID crisis, the developers, St. James Securities, they've they've really been channeling all their energies and focus into that investment funding um, and getting that over the line, because that's obviously quite high risk in the current circumstances. Um, the good news to report is they've agreed heads of terms with a funder now. So that work has paid off. Um, but it does mean there's a slight delay on the planning um, application and the planning consent. Um, so I just wanted just wanted to be um, sharing that with the board by way of update. Um, but in terms of the full business case submission, we're still we're still working towards the November date that we'd agreed with you previously. So so mm -hmm. that stays. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks, Tom. Any questions for Tom? There are various recommendations contained all through the report and again in the absence of questions and there being silence, I'll assume we are adopting all those recommendations. Thank you very much. Can we move on then, Sarah, Tom, to uh, output performance, if there's anything to add there? Sarah, do you want to take this one? Yeah, I'll start. OK, uh, so I'll just deal with the, the learner target. Um, so we agreed at um, the annual performance review that we would um, sort this the learner target out um, and we did have a meeting just actually as we'd gone into lockdown um, and we've now come to the agreement so I'll just repeat what I've got in the paper so we've now moved towards agreement that, that the learn the new learners figure for D2 N2 is 2000 um, and that comes from the LGF3 deal sheet. Um, the 147,000 um, is actually learners supported and that's the terminology that's used on the, the deal sheet from LGF1. Um, so what we're going to monitor in terms of going forward is the 2000 now becomes part of our top three output so we've got the 29,000 jobs the 10,800 homes and now 2,000 learners and that is what's monitored on the spreadsheet that we submit to government every quarter um, and the 147,000 it whilst it being a target it's not a target that's monitored as a figure in a spreadsheet so we're going to report it on a text basis and what we've described it as is that this is the number of people that are engaged in learning activities at the academic institutions where D2N2 has provided funding um, and we've got breakdowns of all those um, institutions uh, for that so hopefully we've we've resolved what has been an outstanding issue for quite some time on that, which I'm sure you'll all be happy about. Um, so I'll move on to the to the specifics. Um, so just, just to give a bit of background as well, this is obviously for quarter four. Um, I will admit that not everyone managed to get information to us due to the situation. Um, so some people who were planning to do surveys at the end of March, obviously they got to the end of March and lots of businesses were no longer on site due to lockdown. So this is not a full position of quarter four, but it's the closest that we can get at this point in time. Obviously, when we move on, those jobs will be able to be counted at a later date um, by those projects that struggled at the time. Um, so the position at quarter four, as you can see, is that we can report um, the jobs and the learners have both hit their targets. Um, and just to give a bit of background on the jobs, what we've done this 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 time is we've we've gone when we did the review, um, and was it February March time, and we looked at all the projects. One of the projects that um, we hadn't really explored in any great detail was the two broadband projects. And we've gone back to a report that we had done in 2017, which was done by Hatchery Generous, which looked at the impact of superfast broadband on the economy and what jobs it creates. Um, and we've got two projects, obviously one in Derbyshire and one in Nottinghamshire. Um, and we've used this report to look at what's been spent on broadband and those jobs that are created. So there's a methodology behind it. They look at different areas to do with productivity, innovation, business startup and flexible working. Um, and and we basically we're now we've reported those figures in this quarter just so, to jump in yeah. on that one so yeah it's a, a dcms uh, related methodology that we've used on this that has been independently verified by hatchery generous to make sure that these jobs are independently uh, sort of 
accountable um, and we can conclude that they are within the acceptable methodology so we've cleared it off with 151 um, with government themselves and it is their their methodology of calculating these outputs based on that investment return that you get the the other thing it does take into account as well especially is safeguarding of jobs and i think particularly poignant at this point in time um without the infrastructure uh, that the digital sort of programs have provided there probably would have been a fair few people that would have been left fairly helpless in terms of being able to facilitate their job from home if they didn't have access to any broadband speed so it's it's been a sort of a time coming but it's a particularly good time to bring these outputs forward i think and leaves us in good stead with regards to the jobs okay. homes i'm afraid it's the usual um story obviously the newark figures are so huge and it's such a large proportion of our target that that without those numbers we're really struggling to, to hit those targets um learners if you remember back to a previous meeting we agreed the reprofile of vision um university at um, west Knox college now we've reprofiled that and they've now counted those outputs that's brought us back in line um, and we're back on track for those um so in terms of the overall position as, as I say, it's it's the homes um, that that is below the expected, um, and say it, it's because such huge numbers are coming from uh, from one project, um, and that's probably about it. So yeah, so this is the last table obviously shows that twenty nine thousand, the ten thousand eight hundred, and the two thousand. What we know we've done today, and where we think we're going to be. Thank you both again. Any questions for Tom or Sarah? If I can just add on the Newark Southern Link Road, because this keeps coming back. Um, I had a conversation with colleagues both at Notts County and Newark, Newark um, and Sherwood District Council. They're getting to a position where they've almost the, resolved the funding, which was the barrier for the scheme to be com completed. I think there's uh, contributions from both the County Council and the District and uh, a business case with Homes England with a view to funding the gap in order for the delivery to continue. The barrier being without the full funding gap, which was identified following the IRA investment, this, the road won't be able to be put in place and therefore is a planning restriction on the ability for the site to deliver any more than 1400 homes. It is on site, it is delivering, but the biggest challenge is that barrier to infrastructure. I understand that they're moving closer to a solution. There is still a funding gap, um, but bearing in mind we started out at nearly a 40 million gap, they're bringing that uh, closer and closer to a point where um, hopefully that scheme will be will be back on track. Thanks, Saj. Any more? No. Nope. OK, thank you very much. Um, items 9 and 10 to projects for approval. Are you going to lead on those, Tom? Yeah, so the first project that we've got up for approval is the uh, Castle Ward scheme, uh, which Derby City Council are leading on. Uh, this project's looking for an investment of £1.5 million pounds towards uh, the development of a school, um, which will unlock major housing delivery in Derby City Centre. Uh, presenting this one, we've got Catherine Williams, uh, John Gilman, and I believe one of the colleagues from Amion on the call. But I'll there's just there's just John and myself, I think, this morning in the yeah, end, Tom. That's, right. uh, that's fine. That's fine. I'll um, I'll share my screen now and put the presentation up. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> Councillor Matthew Hope, can I can I just do a very brief in uh, introduction before? I'll pass over to officers just to give um, us all just a very brief introduction. That be okay? Far away. Okay, so Thanks, obviously Matt. it's um, it's been a long-term project for the council um, the delivery of uh, new homes at Castleboard, and it regeneration is the key to achieving our local plan targets, and of course for the city centre itself, the vibrancy, city living being a key objective uh, in our master plan. So. Getting the new primary school is is critical to deliver um, the homes that we need. And the presentation that uh, the officers will, will offer you here seeks a, uh, approval. Uh, and it's the last piece really in the jigsaw of uh, to make to make this happen. So I will I will concede and pass over to officers to uh, give you the presentation. 
Thanks. Thanks, Matthew. Thank you. OK, morning all. Um, we'll we'll skip through this presentation and, and really thank you for the opportunity to, to talk with you about the project as always. And um, what we hope to show you um, and that officers have recognised at D2N2 is we've now got a strong full business case in place for this project. Um, it took and go for a while this time last year. Um, the school is an absolutely critical part of the social infrastructure that rightly needs to be in place to keep delivering homes at Castle Ward. Um, and viability challenges there mean that um, forward funding of that school by the private sector just wasn't wasn't feasible. Um, so we needed to move quite um, cleverly and quickly to get to get a funding package in place. Um, so from a cabinet decision last September about this project to where we are now today about to let contracts has been a really, um, really challenging but exciting journey. So we're really pleased to be to be um, here today talking to you about this project. Next slide, please, Tom. We all wait with beta breath. <laughs> I think this next slide, yes, yeah, so this is just summarising the recommendations um, to the investment board today. Um, the total project is an £8 million project of which we're asking £1.5 million of local growth funding from the LGF3 programme. Um, and behind the scenes, I know um, Sarah and colleagues at the council have worked hard to get a grant funding agreement lined up. Um, so subject to a board approval today, we'll also be able to move forward with that and get the school on site. Thank you. Next slide. So um, the presentation we've got is structured um, in hopefully a now familiar format to investment board members according to the five key areas of our of our business case. Um, so the strategic case Councillor Holmes has already um, already hinted at and outlined. Um, obviously for D2N2 itself there's there's a really important strategic theme of housing and regeneration. Housing is a key target um, for local growth fund programmes as Sarah's mentioned. Um, and for more locally in Derby, we have um, a target in our local plan of 11,000 new homes within our local plan period. And this this project is key to achieving that. Um, but it's also really important for our wider city centre regeneration efforts. Um, obviously, bringing people to live in the city centre is really important, not only in terms of um, regenerating an otherwise quite run down part of the city, but also to, to bring all of the spend and economic benefits that, that people living in the city centre bring. So it's really important to, to our regeneration plans as well. Um, and as I mentioned before, um, a new primary school is a planning condition of the outline consent for the whole of the Castle Ward um, programme. Um, we have to deliver this in order to move any further forward with, with new homes. Um, so it's critical to, to housing development through to 2030. Thanks, Tom. Next slide. So um, just thought it'd be helpful to remind um, board members um, just of where Castle Ward sit and normally if we were in the room at County Hall or elsewhere I'd stand up and point to the screen um, but if you look on the far right hand side of the scre screen Derby train station is on the periphery of the city centre really um, and then into is marked, um, marked at the far left hand side and Castle Ward as an area sits between that. Um, the outline consent we've got is for 850 homes altogether over a five phase development. Um, we've got a developer partner um, in place, Compendium Living, um, and Homes England are a key partner in our in our delivery of Castle Ward as well. So just as a reminder, phase one is complete. That was 164 homes. They all sold really quickly and really well. So we're making the market there. Um, phase two is on site, phase 2A. There was a slight delay with COVID, but it's back up and running again now. Um, and phases 2B and beyond are, are for, for the future. Um, and you can see in red where the Castle Wall Primary School site sits there. Um, also marked on the plan is the former Derbyshire Royal Infirmary site on London Road. 
Um, this is a separate development with a separate developer in place to deliver that. Um, but the school is also important for um, the DRI site because um, the number of places provided allows for development at both Castlewood and DRI. So the total number of homes that's going to be unlocked by this project is for both Castlewood and the DRI site, which is a really good boost for um, the LGF programme. OK, next slide, please, Tom. So as I've, as I've mentioned already, um, phase one is complete and phase 2A is on site. Um, there's obviously a big effort beyond the school project itself to, to delivering Castle Ward. Um, so we are in the middle of a compulsory purchase order process now. Um, we've um, had the objections period closed. We had some objections, um, but we are working th through those quite positively. Um, and we're just waiting to hear in terms of a public inquiry um, timescale for that. Um, we had housing infrastructure funding agreed about a year ago now to help us with the land acquisition that flows from that CPO. Um, but also Homes England helpfully agreed to give us some money towards the school as well. Um, so that was really positive and um, clearly, as I've mentioned, it's Castle Ward and the DRI site that, that benefit from this infrastructure provision. Next slide, please. Ah, yes, this is where it really comes to life, I guess, because we've managed to um, share some the technologies allowed us to share some um, artist impressions and, and pictures of the school. And given the site, as I'm sure you can appreciate, it's quite a constrained site in an urban area. So we've had to be really clever with the with the design. Um, but I think what we've got is something really exciting that children are going to really benefit from from that learning environment. So um, in terms of the visuals of the, the school, it fit very well within the context and also within the, the wider design, if you like. Um, it's bang in line with that, but we've also been able to bring some clever uses of space as well with, um, with the roof garden that you can see on the bottom left hand picture um, to, to give additional um, play space for the children. Um, and it's meeting still, of course, all of the DfE requirements um, for for a school building. Um, the total number of places is 315, which will allow for both both the nursery, a nursery as well. Um, so it's a really exciting design, and we're really really pleased with with the result. There. Thank you, Tom. Next slide. Are we stuck? I think it might be all the images. There we go. OK, so um, if that was the strategic case for why the school is important, the commercial case and the benefits um, are what, what are on the screen in front of you now. Um, so clearly in terms of the direct and indirect benefits, there's the school places themselves and the jobs that are created for the teaching and non-teaching staff as a result. Um, the number of homes that this unlocks is really significant at, at over over 1600 homes from both the sites um, and whilst we know that um, the LGF program doesn't count construction jobs there's still a significant amount of economic activity in the space that we have counted within within the business case itself um, we've profiled the delivery of housing as well um, which is in the table at the bottom of the uh, before clearly there's there's much less to the generation spin-offs for, for the city centre um and and the benefits to Derby. Derby. Okay, next slide please, Tom. Okay, so um obviously um as Tom mentioned, AMI and Consulting were, were hoping to join and, and haven't been able to today, but they've they've done a full um, economic case and economic impact assessment of the project, um, which has fed in, into the into the business case we've submitted submitted. 
um, and in terms of the management of the project and how we're going to deliver it. It is a city council project, so um, we've wor worked closely with our school organisation team to get this project up and running. Um, we have a contractor, Morgan Sindor, who are appointed through our SCAPE, regional SCAPE framework. Um, and the City Council's property team are going to oversee the management of the construction works and that contract with Morgan Sindel. Um, and simultaneously, the um, school's organisation team are in the middle of a process to select an academy trust to manage the school. Um, that's gone really well. We've had interest from a number of parties um, and we are looking to take a cabinet report in August with a recommendation on our preferred bidder to run the school. Um, there's a challenging timescale here, but we'll talk a bit more about that in the next couple of slides because um, clearly we have the, the driver to spend FGF funding by March 21, which is important. Um, but equally, we're driven by academic years here. You, it's not sensible to open a school partway through the year, so we're driven by a September 21 opening um, target for the school. So all of our construction programme is geared towards that. Um, and the Academy Trust selection process is geared towards that as well. So subject to that cabinet approval process, um, we would intend to be in contract um, operate by, by December, by the end of this year, which would be a good time to, to both to, to gear up for an opening of the school in, in December 20. Thanks. Tom, next slide. So in terms of the programme, um, there's a number of things have come together um, really in the last few weeks, all, all in quite quite a condensed time frame, which has been challenging. But we are all day, um, and we achieved planning consent in May. Um, the site was already in council ownership because it was previously and we have all of the other um, funding set up for the project. It's all in contract um, and we have our own internal um, board approval for signing a contract this week, subject to the LGF decision today. Um, and if we're able to do that on the 18th of June, as we, we are planning to, then that um, generates a programme of construction that leads to the school opening in September 2021. Um, and at this point, because um, um, we were we were thinking about this in advance and expecting that many of the board's questions would be around delivery. Firstly, given how time given COVID-19 impacts. So at this point, I'd just like to invite my colleague, John, just to say and our schools and property teams have done to really set us up well for that delivery timescale and, and mean that we're confident we can achieve it. So, John, are you able to come in now, please? Yes, good morning. I trust you can hear me OK. Um, can I just yeah. talk, as, as Catherine's mentioned, about the, the practical construction uh, measures that are in place to ensure we deliver on time? Um, and as the programme shows, there's a lot of condensed activity in, in Q2. We have planning consent in place. Morgan Sindel have, have taken a, a soft occupation, and soft start of the site over the last four weeks to prep it. So all of the, the prep work for the groundworks contract is, has been done. And indeed, pending the signing of the construction contract on Thursday, the piling rig is actually booked for Monday next week. So they can hit the ground running with the groundworks package. And the, the form of construction for schools anyway tends to be through modern methods of construction through a frame system. And on this one, it's no different. It's a, a structural steel frame. So that provides um, certainty in terms of accuracy of, of, of construction methodology. It provides really quick speed of construction. The steel frame, all the steel for that is in stock, um, stockpiled in a local subcontractor's yard, and the design for the structural steel frame has been submitted uh, to the subcontractor as well. So we've no concerns with, with supply chain in terms of the, the main fabric. There is a, a concrete deck roof that, is, as Catherine's shown, provides for the roof garden and the roof play area. 
And the additional benefit of that is there's a hot pour system, a rubber or tar macadam system that, that provides uh, weather seal really quickly. So the whole building will be weather tight quite quickly. And um, there's no brickwork that's on the critical path that normally trips up construction contracts that suffer through weather related delays. And that's why the team are confident of being able to, to get the entire building complete within a, a 14, 15 month window. As Catherine's mentioned, um, the multi academy trust operator process is running in tandem. And just for Councillor Holmes' benefit, there will be a cabinet report in August, I believe, with the moderators' um, proposals that were unanimous for the selection of the, the preferred operator. So I hope that's OK, Catherine, for sort of canter through how the, the scheme has been designed and programmed for Brilliant. construction. Thanks, John. Thank you. Yeah. OK, next slide, please, Tom. I'm just switching my camera off because my network connection is a little slow, so it, it helps. It helps with that. Just a few more slides to go. <laughs> Well, with you, Catherine, we've got the slide up, I think, the risks slide. Oh, is it risks? OK, it's my end then. Thanks, David. I'll, I'll, I've got it on a separate screen, so I'll I'll talk to that. So um, the three we've just highlighted the key three key risks, really, just to, to show the board um, what our mitigation plans are for that. Um, funding was um, a challenge, um, but the LGF funding decision is the final one in the jigsaw puzzle, as, as um, Councillor Holmes said at the beginning. We've got our contract in place for HIF money and the council funds are all secure, so um, so that's mitigated. Um, in, in terms of, we've, as, as John said, we've done extensive ground investigations prior to starting on site. Um, and we've considered the particular constraints of the site as well when de designing the school um, and we've lined up um, as much as we can in advance of start on site to, to hit the ground running. And then in terms of, of COVID-19 impact, um, supply chain, as John said, has, has been covered. We've got much of the key materials already ordered and in stock. And um, in terms of the measures needed to deliver construction on site, they've been accounted, been negotiated and agreed with Morgan. So, so um, to count final costs. Okay, next slide, please. Um, the next slide um, just summarises the financial case in terms of the funding that I've already outlined, which evidences the um, LGF contribution to the eight, eight million pound school. Already, because I think my computer's lagging behind a little bit. Do you want to move on, Tom, to the to the slide, the LGF spend profile slide, please? Yeah, we're on that now. Maybe someone out when that's up, because I'm still seeing risks. Yeah, yeah. we're on now. Catherine. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. As obviously with us being the year of the LGF. Yeah. Thanks. Last year of the program, we just wanted to show how we'd profile spend on the year. So, um, as you can see, we forward, obviously we're prioritising LGF funding first of all. Um, we have longer to spend there. Catherine, your reception isn't great. So, is it possible for John to to talk to like quarter to four? Miss if quite, we need it. Sorry, Catherine, we're missing quite a lot of what you're you're saying. So. Is John able to take us through these oh, slides? We're getting okay. every second or third word. Okay, apologies for that. Uh, Can John take over? If you're able yeah. to, John. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no problem. Okay, so for the for the financial year spend, um, we're able to to draw down pretty much immediately, but we expect. The majority of the spend in in Q2 and Q3, and that will tie in then when with the 
the major works in terms of the, the superstructure, um, all of the m and works and then finally the external works and and the finishing which will will take us through to to, to q4 um and we can draw down all of the lgf given the the nature of the spend with it been an eight million pound contract in conjunction with our hif allocation and we've got about four million left on hif we spent half a million there they're about so far on on design planning and and enabling works um Next slide, please, Tom. OK, I, I don't think there's any more pop up information there. So just quickly to talk you through the um, VFM credentials uh, that Amian kindly assisted with as part of the full business case. So based on the uh, CLG appraisal, guide using land value uplift and allowing for the optimism bias. We've got a benefit cost ratio of, of 2.51 um, and that clearly supports the, the, the delivery of the, uh, no, I'm sorry, that's, that's factored through the number of homes that the, the scheme delivers, both in terms of Castle Ward and the, and the DRI site. And uh, just to make sure we're boxed off in terms of state aid, we've had opinion from Freeze and we've had it twice because we've provided the same opinion to to um, Homes England for the HIF contract, but they did reissue a state aid uh, compliant letter in support of the of the full business case. And next slide, please, Tom. So just to to summarise then the, the the narrative and the case that's um, been put before the board for, for kind consideration. Um, we need to unlock the housing delivery through, through the education and social infrastructure that we're proposing. It's a perfect fit with all of the strategic plans, both of the LEP and through the, the city council in terms of its master plan and, and local plan delivery for housing. We create significant school places and, and there's no capacity elsewhere actually and we have lost one or two families from Castle Ward because we haven't been able to, to open the school in time for their for their children's intake. So um, we're, we're really, really pleased that, that we can bring this off, create the relevant school places, create the housing development and then the permanent and the temporary job creation through education and, and construction use. Um, as we've gone through, we have the funding in place pending the decision on LGF today, contractors ready and the Academy Trust operator, uh, all things being equal, but will be appointed at the end of the year. Um, it's state aid compliant and provides a high value for money assessment. So I um, hope that is sufficient for you. And please, I think the last slide was any questions if, uh, if the board would like to ask. I think that's it, Thank Tom. Thank you, John. Yeah, cheers. Sam, go ahead. Yes, thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, good presentation. Thank you. Um, I've got a few questions, a few notes I made uh, in there about, is there no funding from Department for Education at all? When you say that Derby City Council is putting in £2.1 million, pounds, what what is that what is that funding from from dcc is that is that dcc capital investment or is that actually money that's coming through a grant from department department for education um it's rare it's rare it's rare to see a school um built without any any department for education funding so i wondered if that's a grant um can i answer that one sam um as as i understand i'm not an expert on on education funding but because, because the overall outline consent for Castle Ward required the provision of, of school facilities, I believe government guidance is that if, if that is deemed to be delivered through planning condition or section 106 as, as the equivalent um, mechanism in, in planning terms, then it, it can't benefit from a Department for Education grant. And so we've, we've had to go through um, rather a complex process of, of jigsaw piecing relevant funding streams together. 
and that leaves a gap of about 2.1 million, which, as we've said, is, is DCC funding. So that's direct capital investment that was approved by Cabinet, and that's circa half a million. And then the remaining 1.6 will be sort of tax increment financing based through Section 106 that the subsequent housing will generate. And uh, there's one additional site opposite into actually on Traffic Street. It's got a relatively low value, but it's the last piece of DCC land in Castlewall that isn't developed. So we hope to bring that forward over the next five years and the capital receipt will be recycled to, to pay for the effectively pay for the school finance. And that was all approved at Cabinet through both the September and the, the December 19 Cabinet approvals. OK, thanks. My only other point and question would be <clears throat> to the um, D2N2, uh, D2N2 officers, the LEP officers about have we done this before? Is there any precedent in our history of funding a uh, putting funding into a to a school school facility? I'm not saying we shouldn't. Just be good to get a bit of advice from from LEP officers on whether whether we've done it before and whether it's you know does it happen in other LEP areas? So I can pick that up. I mean, school infrastructure is classed as enabling infrastructure for housing development. And certainly from my past experience, this sort of project has been um, funded through local growth fund. Um, and it's classed as it, it, essentially it's key infrastructure to bring forward housing development. Without it, the planning conditions wouldn't be able to be met for the housing development to progress. So, it, you know, I, whilst I'm not entirely sure whether, and Tom will know, whether we funded previous school provision through our local growth fund, it's, it's something that is classed as eligible and certainly funded in other LEP areas. And as I say, the LEP that I was previously a part of have funded um, school investment to bring forward housing. But we haven't directly, no, not through us. Um, but yeah, I know it is and has been done in other LEP areas. So I worked in Northamptonshire, which is known as a quite a large housing development area. And majority of the schemes that we were engaged in there was infrastructure to forward develop um, housing and commercial development. So school infrastructure went in on quite a few of the schemes that were, were, were funded through local growth fund. So Kettering, for example, and Northampton all had school infrastructure to support housing delivery. OK, thank you. Thanks, Sam. Are you happy with all that? Sorry, I just muted. Yes, Chair. Thank you. Good. Excellent. Thank you. Any more questions on the Castle Ward School? OK, so I am looking for the approval of the, approval of the grant request of 1.5 million for that project. Again, it's easiest if I take silence as agreement. So we have agreement, I think. Thank you very much, folks. Um, right. Tom, we can move on to the NTU project. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so yeah. After that one, uh, we've next got the NTU uh, Nursing and Allied Health Provision um, in Mansfield project that's coming forward for approval um, and delivering the presentation on this one is uh, Mark Biggs, who's the Pro Vice Chancellor and uh, Head of the College of Technology and Science. And then we have Fiona Anderson, who's the Head of Civic Engagement at uh, NTU. So. I will now see if the technology can do it twice in a row. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. morning. I have declared my Hello. interest. Bye. Right, here we go. So if uh, Mark and Fiona, if you just want to let me know when you want me to skip on to the next slide, I'll do that for okay. you. Thanks very much, Tom, uh, and uh, thank you um, to the board uh, and to the LEP for um, uh, considering our um, bid for a, a training facility uh, up in Mansfield to serve in particular the Mansfield and Ashfield areas, which we're going to be talking about in a bit more detail now. Um, uh, as Tom said, my name is Mark Biggs. I'm the uh, Pro Vice Chancellor and Head of College of Science and Technology at Nottingham Trent University. Um, I'm a member of the executive team at NTU and the sponsor for um, our Mansfield and Ashfield program, which I will talk more about um, during the course of this uh, uh, presentation. Um, I'll just hand over Fiona so she can uh, briefly introduce herself. 
Thank you, Mark. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Fiona Anderson, as, as Tom mentioned, Head of Civic Engagement at NTU. And I'm also our business lead for our programme of development across Mansfield and Ashfield. And um, that's my role here today. So I'll just hand back to Mark to kick us off on the first slide. Thank you. Thanks very much, Fiona. Um, so, Tom, if you want to just kick on to the first slide. Great, OK. All right, so um, uh, the proposal that uh, we're going to talk about uh, today is part of our um, uh, the university's Mansfield and Ashfield Development Programme uh, that Fiona mentioned. Um, this is very much at the heart of uh, the institution's strategy for the next five years. Um, uh, and in a nutshell, um, the aim of this uh, particular um, aspect of our strategy is to um, develop lasting social and economic change for resident students and businesses in the Mansfield and Ashfield area. Um, this is one of our flagship programs actually within, within our uh, strategy. Now this particular um, development that we're proposing is um, uh, just one element of that program. It has many, many aspects, um, but this particular element is all about uh, delivering local uh, training needs uh, for local people within Mansfield and Ashfield to meet the needs of the local employers, and in particular the uh, the various NHS trusts uh, and, and bodies uh, in Mansfield and Ashfield area, um, uh, and um, the East Midlands more generally, um, uh, and uh, also uh, it's recognised as delivering the needs of uh, the Nottinghamshire by the Nottinghamshire County Council. And these are all partners uh, in this bid. Um, they, in various ways, are contributing um, placements in particular, have committed to delivering placements in particular for uh, students that will be going through this facility. We're also working in partnership with uh, Vision West Nottinghamshire College. Um, uh, in terms of delivering um, our higher education provision within um, Mansfield and Ashfield. Uh, and um, in this particular case, the site of the facility that we're proposing here is based on their campus, but it will be wholly uh, run uh, by uh, Nottingham Trent University and the training there will be delivered by Nottingham Trent University um, and they will be Nottingham Trent University students. Um, the uh, intention is is that uh, we will deliver um, economic and social uh, benefits for people, as I've already said, um, and this particular uh, proposal will also um, ultimately feed through into better health and well-being for uh, the people in Mansfield and Ashfield. OK, next slide, if we can. Thanks very much, Tom. Um, we've uh, established that uh, uh, what we are uh, proposing here very much resonates with the D2N2 LEP strategy. Um, so uh, as summarised uh, here, so uh, for example, developing skills and knowledge for the future uh, theme very much connects with the project um, and um, the uh, potential for health and social care to um, develop or deliver um, jobs locally within the area is also uh, recognised uh, in the strategy. Um, and um, the uh, intention here is, is to provide um, or, or for the provision that we are providing through this facility to be as accessible as possible to the uh, local um, uh, the local um, people. Um, and so we will ensure that uh, um, uh, access to the courses is as wide as possible um, as, as we do with all of our courses um, in Mansfield and Ashfield. OK, thanks very much, Tom. OK, so we've uh, very clearly established um, the need uh, for this facility uh, in Mansfield and Ashfield uh, to deliver needs within the area. So um, nationally, of course, there is it's well known that there is a, a huge shortage of uh, nurses uh, within the UK. So um, a statistic there for June of last year, about this time last year, 40,000 uh, shortfall in uh, nurses uh, nationally. And of course, um, the East Midlands is no exception to that. There was about 8,000 nursing vacancies um, at the end of last year, uh, for example. And this is set to only be exacerbated by around the third of the nurses being uh, uh, set to retire by 2026, which is um, the period over which this uh, proposal is um, uh, the timeline of this proposal. Um, paramedics is uh, no exception at all uh, uh, to that or, or, or no different to that. Um, so the East Midlands Ambulance Service um, continue to struggle to fill uh, the vacancies that they've had 
um, uh, on their books um, for a, a number of years, and we're working very closely with them um, now to uh, try and address that particular challenge. Um, uh, of course, um, as this uh, slide says, uh, the challenge has been long-standing uh, challenge where um, the uh, demand on the um, uh, ambulance services uh, increased 6% year on year for the last five years on average. Um, and of course, the uh, pandemic can't have helped uh, that situation uh, at all and is only probably set to get uh, uh, even uh, more challenging. Um, so there is a real need for us to deli deliver um, or to uh, be able to develop uh, the people locally within Mansfield and Asheville to fill the local healthcare profession needs. Um, and this facility is very much uh, aimed at addressing uh, that particular need. Thanks, Tom. Next slide. OK, the actual uh, proposal itself, um, we're uh, proposing um, to create a 600 square metre uh, teaching and clinical space uh, facility uh, in Mansfield on the Vision West Knotts College campus. I've already indicated for training nurses and allied health professionals. Um, the total project cost is um, just slightly under £1.2 million, um, made up of um, uh, roughly around half of that will be um, for refurbishment costs or, or uh, taking an existing facility, um, removing um, the insides of that facility, that building, um, and replacing it with um, the uh, interior required for teaching um, and training of uh, uh, healthcare professionals. Um, and then the rest of the money is for facilities such as specialist equipment and um, IT and audiovisual uh, facilities. Um, the intention here is for uh, um, the LEP to contribute um, £580,000 of that, uh, with the other half coming from NTU. Thanks very much, Tom. OK, for that, um, uh, uh, we will be delivering um, over the course of the next five years uh, more than 700 um, students. Um, to meet local uh, needs of employers uh, in Mansfield and Ashfield and the wider area around uh, those uh, two um, um, uh, districts. Uh, the details are shown in the table here, but uh, broadly speaking, we've got different um, um, varieties of uh, BSc in nursing, um, as well as apprenticeships uh, delivered uh, in collaboration with local um, uh, health uh, NHS trusts. Um, we have uh, also foundation degree uh, in nursing associate um, that's uh, being uh, established with the um, uh, Sherwood Forest Hospital Foundation Trust. Um, and then also we've got paramedic uh, training, uh, both in terms of ambulance technician uh, practice, um, which uh, we will take our first students in November 2020. Um, they'll be the first students going through the facility in Mansfield. Um, uh, and then in later years, we're looking to put on um, BSc in occupational therapy. There's also other plans that we are uh, in the process of investigating, uh, but will be subject to um, further market analysis. Um, uh, and so our very much anticipation is the 735 students is, is a conservative estimate um, that will be using this facility over the next five years. Uh, in addition to that, we'll also be employing around about 10 uh, academic staff to deliver the courses uh, in uh, Mansfield and Ashfield. Um, the initial numbers will be um, uh, two or three, um, and that will rise over the period of the five years as the student numbers grow to around 10 um, staff in Mansfield. Thank you very much, Tom. OK, in terms of delivery of the project, um, so um, we have an extremely experienced construction services team uh, within NTU that tends to deliver uh, our um, more smaller uh, projects such as this one. Um, this has uh, this team has uh, uh, many decades of collective experience between them. Um, uh, they've already led the uh, um, tendering process and uh, that underpins this particular bid. Uh, and then we'll see the um, delivery of the um, uh, the facility over the course of the coming six months. And we'll a bit more detail about that in a second. Um, the overall program uh, falls within the oversight and governance of NTU's Mansfield Program Management Board uh, that I uh, chair. Um, uh, and Fiona is uh, the main project lead on that. Um, 
uh, um, program, as, uh, as already indicated, and will also be closely involved in overseeing um, the um, this development. The um, budget management of the project will be uh, overseen by NTU's lead construction manager, with um, our NTU finance business manager um, overseeing um, claims um, and the finances more generally. Um, in terms of uh, judging the performance of the uh, of the uh, project, uh, there are three key uh, performance indicators um, or composite key performance indicators. The first is the student numbers, uh, 735, but also their origin. We're primarily looking for them to come from the local area, although we very much hope uh, that uh, and we'll be looking for uh, additional students coming in from uh, outside of the area uh, over time, growing over time. Um, there will be a local, uh, the, the, where those students go to once they graduate will be really important as well. We're clearly uh, wanting to deliver uh, and fill those gaps uh, that are uh, employment, um, employment vacancies uh, in the local area. Uh, and we, of course, want to very much meet the needs of our partners um, that have been indicated on the uh, initial slide in the slide pack. And so that will be important as well. Thanks very much, Tom. OK, a, bit, a little bit small here uh, over on the right hand side is the uh, is the uh, diagram of the I don't know whether you can see my cursor. You probably can't. But anyway, broadly speaking, in the middle of the facility, there are two um, uh, wards or mock wards. And then we've got teaching facilities um, around the periphery, uh, lecture rooms and small uh, and, and small spaces for tutorials and so forth. Um, uh, I'm sure you'll be interested in how we would use that facility if we have COVID um, in another uh, uh, still in place, uh, restrictions in place. I'll talk about those in Q&A um, if you wish. Um, the uh, uh, construction itself is relatively straightforward. We're taking an existing building that's modern. Uh, we're refurbishing it, um, so stripping out the existing interior and replacing it with the uh, specialist facilities. It's fairly straightforward. We've actually done this on the Clifton campus with another building, so have considerable experience in doing exactly the same thing um, and feel that six month construction period is 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 quite conservative. In fact, for that um, we have uh, because we're using our own um, construction services team, we're avoiding all of the overheads associated with a main contractor. Um, and so that's uh, represents uh, um, uh, or adds to the value uh, for money. Uh, for this particular project. Thanks, Tom. OK, in terms of the time scale, um, so or the timeline, um, so we're looking to deliver the first phase. So that's the completed most of the uh, com completed fit out uh, by um, September 2020 with the idea that it will be ready for students. Uh, the ambulance technician practitioner program to start in November 2020. Uh, we've already um, signed the lease with NTU or signed the agreement to lease with NTU, sorry, with the, with the college, I should say, um, uh, along with the partnership agreement. Um, the, uh, the college has indicated we can take possession of the building um, sooner than July if need be because there are no students there. Um, uh, and uh, we are confident we can get uh, the workers on site. Uh, we, in fact, we've got a uh, um, significant number of projects uh, ongoing at the moment um, where work is uh, happening um, with appropriate uh, safety protocols in place for COVID. Um, the uh, final fit out uh, for nursing will occur by the end of December 2020. Um, we need to have that done in order for the Nursing and Midwifery Council visit in February 2021, um, where we'll be seek. This was all part of the um, uh, accreditation process that we need to go through with the council um, in order for us to offer the uh, first BSc uh, in nursing um, programs from September 2021 onwards. Thanks, Tom. OK, um, I think uh, that's uh, the end of our presentation. So I just wanted to summarise by saying that um, NTU is uh, seeking £580,000 to deliver a facility to train uh, local people locally to meet a demonstrable local employer needs. Um, this uh, development Ed, very much resonates with, I think, the um, uh, strategy of the LEP um, and commend it to you. Happy to take questions uh, at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. I'll give you any, any questions.
Can I just jump in quickly, uh, just to clarify one thing? So this project initially came on looking for about 1.4, well, it was a 1.4 million total cost, actually, through what Mark was talking about in the management case um, and the internal uh, construction team at NTU. It's come down to 1.1, so hence why it's 580,000 now uh, requested from the lab. Thanks, Tom. Can I just jump in and just do a correction? Um, There's just a typo on the paper. So it does say that on the spending profile it's 518, but it should be 580. So um, if we can just correct that for the minutes. Thank you, Sarah. Sounds a really exciting project. Well, I'm not allowed to say anything. I've declared my interest now. OK. So <laughs> I'll withdraw that. <laughs> Anybody else got any comments? Sounds really dull to me. Uh, Joe, Joe, have you got your hand up? I see it. Joe's I got have, a hand yeah. up. <laughs> I have, I've got your yeah, little I, hand up. I think it's a fantastic project. I've uh, been working very closely with um, the CCG and talking quite at the front line with quite a lot of nurses who are actually coming up for, for retirement. I think this is well needed and well placed for north of the uh, north of the county. I think it's it's going to bridge such a gap and um, I think it's fantastic for the people in Mansfield and those people around that because I think people will travel to this facility and for these kind of jobs. It's much needed, very much needed, so fully in support of it. Thank you, Jeremy. Anybody else? Not an easy ride then, Mark. I can't believe that I've delivered it that clearly and crisply. But uh, thank you very much, everybody, for your uh, um, uh, for uh, listening to us, uh, and um, uh, obviously uh, look for uh, support from the LEP. But uh, over to you, David. Okay. Well, you may or may not about be about to hear that. Um, right. So we're looking for uh, approval for the grant request of four five hundred eighty thousand pounds for this project. Um, again, I'll take. Silence as agreement. I'm seeing nods as well, so I think we have agreement to that project also. So, sorry about the dog. Um, <laughs> the dog even approves. <laughs> he's, he's more than happy. He's a very good paramedic, actually. So, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Well. So, thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. We'll leave, leave you to it. Yeah. Bye bye. Stay safe, bye. everyone. Bye. Bye. So it just remains for the rest of us to um, deal with part two exempt items. And I don't think we have any public or press with us, so we are clear to go. I'm can not we aware. Just start Can we just start recording? Yeah, I, I have done. That's fine. Yeah. yeah.